All right, good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to Lifeline Church. We're so happy to be at all of us together today. My name is Tiffany, if I haven't met you before. Uh, my husband, Elliot, and I have the great honor and privilege of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. And we have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline. And we do that every single week in our daily life by just loving and serving Jesus in all the places. Uh, and so we're real intentional. We bring messages on purpose that are kind of practical <laughs> because we want to know how Jesus works every day. If he's, our, if he's our God, if he's our Savior, he loves us, he gave himself for us, he's alive in power inside of us, how do we activate that and how do we live in power? Uh, so we believe that we're real on purpose about being able to do that. Um, have you guys ever played this game? Do you guys know this game? Catchphrase? Catchphrase! This is my favorite party game, my all-time favorite party game. And we're going to play it. Are you guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, if you've never played it, it's like Taboo, kind of, and some other game. And it beeps really loud. And then as you run out of time, it starts to beep faster, so you get panicky. And it's going to give you, you're not going to see the word. I'm going to see the word. There's going to be a word on the screen that I can't say, and I'm going to try and get you to guess what it is, okay? So I'm just going to shout out some clues. Is everybody ready? Okay, first one. Uh, this is when you could describe it as like having love handles all the way around. Muffin top, there it is. Okay, here's another one. This is when uh, you can't pay your your uh, your credit card debt on time, and so you file or declare bankruptcy. You guys are so good. You're so good. Okay, this is one um, when uh, you're not telling the truth, and it's not black. It's white lie. There you go. So good. Okay. Uh, nah. This is uh, in the game of something ball. You run around and all the they're all, but everybody's on. Everybody's on one. It's called the. Come on! They're all full, and then you get a home run by all of them. No, I don't want the name of the sport. I feel like we missed it. Okay, in it was go, it was uh, loaded bases. Okay, and then there's uh, this br this is the bridge is in I don't know what that is actually. Just kidding. Oh, this is country. Yeah. Yeah. Mind dance. Okay, um, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Uh, there's a lot. okay. The in gymnastics, you wear this. This is your outfit. So good. Uh, this part of your body. Mm. The, yeah, hamstring. Come on, people. Okay, not the not the port side, but the starboard. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You guys are so good at that game. So good. That's my favorite part of the game. Uh, the first three weren't real. I made those up. They weren't part of the game. Okay, we're in, we're, <laughs> we're in week two of a series called Today I Choose. And the big idea is this. Following Jesus isn't one big choice we make. It's those countless daily choices. Countless daily choices that we make. Uh, so we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about Today I Choose. The, uh, we love following along and writing notes because it's one thing to hear something good, and it's another thing to just interact with it. So if you like to take notes, you want to you know, be able to come back later, there's two ways you can do that. One, there's uh, message notes inside your bulletin if you got one, and you can fill in those blanks as we go along. And then there's all, I'm like out of breath. That was intense trying to get you guys to guess those words. <laughs> <laughs> and it beeps, and I'm panicky. Uh, the other one is the YouVersion Bible app. So if you have the YouVersion Bible app, we're in there. You can follow Lifeline Church as your church, and then you can also pull up the events tab. We populate those every week, so you can take digital notes. And that's great, because if something ministered to you in the message, whether it was a scripture or one of the words, you can go back and just find that later, and you always have it with you. So there's two ways to do that. Um, so initially what we do is we make one big choice to follow Jesus. If we've given our life to Christ, if we would say we're a Jesus follower, we're a Christian, we've made the one big choice to follow Jesus. But from that moment forward, our lives are full of all those little choices where we get to decide whether or not that one big choice really applies to every area of my life and all my other decisions. And so I don't know about you, but I've never met anybody who on purpose decided to grow up and have a muffin top, you know, like that <laughs> their plan for life wasn't to do that or, you know, grow up and like have to declare bankruptcy or watch their life fall apart because they just couldn't stop lying. Like that was no one's plan on purpose, but chances are, um, 
we, you know, and you yourself, you've, you've never made any of those decisions. I'm not describing you at all. But chances are you have made and we've all made some poor choices that we didn't plan on. Like when we were younger or even just five years ago, we didn't plan on making that choice in life that kind of turned something around. Or maybe it wasn't even a big choice. It was just all these little choices. And we found ourselves in this place where like, how did I how did I get here and why am I here? And that's not who I planned on being, but I'm finding that that's who I am. And I kind of want to unearth and uncover that. That stuff. Um, so none of us plan to do that, but the playing field, what's great about that is the playing field is level. <laughs> you know, we've all got choices and decisions that we've made where we could look back with regret and say, man, I, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Uh, and I was kind of thinking about it. When we choose Jesus, it's not like we get to put on this superhero cape, you know, like... <laughs> Now, I like nothing bad is ever going to, like we become invincible with our superhero cape of Jesus. And I can just keep doing all the same things that I used to do, but now I'm invincible. You know, like I got Jesus on my back. <laughs> uh, and like, that's not, that's not it. That would be easier if Jesus was just that superhero cape. But it's more like, honestly, it's more like I voluntarily enlisted in the military. And I'm going through basic training. And in basic training, they're going to teach me a new way to live life. There's a, there's a new standard. There's a new set of rules. And now I'm, I'm in a group of people, and other people are depending on me to follow the training I received. That's more what Christianity is like. It's we're voluntarily enlisting in this new way of life where people are counting on us. And it's not counting on us that if I don't fulfill it, I'm going to let them down. But there's power and purpose that God has put inside of his church. And when the church doesn't live up to those expectations, the rest of the world suffers because the local the local church is the hope of the world. And so it does, it, it matters. Um, and I've been a Christian my, my whole life. I grew up in church. Uh, and I've learned that I can't make choices like my friends who don't know Jesus and have the blessing and the grace of God on my life. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> and I've also learned that living the way God laid out is something I've got to choose for myself. And every day I've got to decide to make those choices. Nobody else can do that for me. And so our theme scripture for this whole series today I choose is out of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. And it's when Moses is speaking to the, the, the group of Israelites, and they're in between two mountains, and he's saying, I'm, the Lord has told them, you know, to put the curses on this mountain and the blessings on this mountain. And then Moses looks at them and says, now you have to choose which one you want. You want blessings or you want curses. And so he says, today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. <laughs> oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. And I love that because the choices that we make provide life for those who come after us or death. But we're, we're, in the, we're in the vein of life. The choices we make have the ability to provide life for those who come after us. And so today what I want to talk about is overcoming temptation overcoming temptation. Because it's one thing to make that one big choice to follow Jesus and knowing that you want to choose life and you want his blessing and his favor and his provision for you and your descendants. It's another thing to face temptation in the middle of that big choice and then all of a sudden be reeling with guilt and shame and maybe depression and then finding yourself questioning the goodness of God or your ability to follow Jesus. Because I made the one big choice, but I keep seeming to fail. I keep seeming to give in to temptation. I keep seeming to find myself in this place where I thought I wouldn't be here. So am I like, am I really good at following Jesus? Am I cut out for that? Or is Jesus big enough for my problems? Is he big enough to get me through this stuff? Because it's like that cape of invincibility didn't work against my everyday life. And I, I want to tackle that. I want to talk about that. This stuff matters because our spiritual life, that choice to follow Jesus and our everyday everyday decisions, they're not separate from each other. The choice to follow Jesus and then every choice I make after that, they're all connected. The spiritual things aren't separate from the everyday things. And this world, the, actually the word of God is full of practical choices that impact our spiritual well-being. The word of God is full of spiritual choices that impact our, our, our physical and spiritual well-being. So scripture talks to us over and over again, telling us that we need to be prepared. And we're going to look at that because this is why scripture tells us we need to be prepared. There is an enemy. God has an enemy that's after his kids. 
We're his kids. And every single day, he's going to try and attack us. Every day. Like, there's no escaping from it. There's an enemy of God, and he's after his kids. And so there's two warnings in Scripture. I want to bring those up to us. One is from Paul. The first warning I'm going to read is from Paul. And the other warning I'm going to read is from Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and he says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Okay, and then the second warning is from Jesus out of Matthew 26, 41. He's talking to people who are following him, and he says, actually, it's at the most difficult time in Jesus' life. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane, like this is it. And he tells his closest disciples, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's two warnings in Scripture. And what I want to see is some encouraging truths first before we get into this that they're going to build us up. So number one, there is a guard that we can have up against temptation, and it's going to serve to protect us. So it's not like we're just at the whim of every temptation that may come our way. There's a guard that we can put up to put a barrier between temptation and myself. That's encouraging. That is encouraging because I, I I can block some things. Number two, it is possible for our faith to provide a sure grip for our lives. In other words, our faith can keep us in a place that's immovable where we stand and the temptation passes over us. So I can remain in this one spot and the temptation can come at me, but pass over me. That's what our faith can do. We can be courageous and we can be strong. And in fact, we need to be both. When the word says like in Joshua, be strong and courageous. To lots of people, God says, be strong and courageous. Let me tell you this. That's because we have to be strong and we have to be courageous. What it means to be courageous is to be afraid and to face it anyway, to stand up in faith going, I'm shaking in my boots on the inside, but I'm being strong and I'm being courageous and I'm putting this into practice and I'm going to watch my God pass over me. I'm going to watch him do things for me, but we've got to be strong and courageous in the meantime, which means we don't shy away into like a place of passivity and just hiding from the world, but we go out with, with when we're strength and, and courage. And then number four, The Spirit of God is not an invincibility cloak that we put on, but he is in us, and he is willing. That's what Jesus said. The Spirit is in you, and he's willing. So if we choose to watch and pray, that's big. If we choose to watch and pray, watch and pray are active things. I've I've got to choose to watch, and I've got to choose to pray. Those are active things. Then with his help, we will not fall into temptation. That means we're going to see it. We're going to see the temptation. We're going to feel the temptation. We might even entertain the idea of whatever the temptation is, but we're going to walk away from it. So I'll see it, but I'll walk away from it. And I just want to give us some encouragement because a lot of people that I've talked to seem to beat themselves up over the fact that they were tempted. Like I had a thought and I was tempted. And so then they become guilty. You're not guilty. There's an enemy who's going to try and plant things in your mind. You become guilty when you act on it. You become guilty when you continue to entertain it. But the fact that it came to you, that just gives you the opportunity to put it away. And so don't let yourself become condemned just for having a thought. That's, that's false. That's the lie and the trick of the enemy who's trying to destroy you, God's kid. Okay, so there's two reasons why we need to be on our guard watching and praying. Two reasons. Number one is you can outwit the devil. Guys, we can outwit the devil. And this matters because he is playing games for your life. He is playing a game for your life. And Jesus, Peter, Paul, and James all talk about it. They all talk about the fact that the devil is playing games, not just for your life, but with your life. But there's a God who loves us, and we can outwit him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blast you with like a million scriptures right now, okay? So the first one comes from Paul. It's out of 2 Corinthians 2.11. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says this. He, he talks about forgiveness. He sets it up in verse 10, and he's talking about forgiveness, how the church needs to operate in forgiveness. We need to make allowances for each other. We need to forgive each other's faults so that Satan will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. Another translation says we are not unaware of his devices. And so one of the devices that the enemy uses is to get you bitter and angry and harboring unforgiveness towards someone. And then the enemy comes in and he starts playing mind games with you. And when he starts playing mind games with you, it's easy to give in to the temptation of being mean 
or gossiping or talking behind someone's back or putting them down. Those are all temptations. And the, and the scripture says, be on your guard, watch and pray so that you don't fall into that temptation. John 10, 10, this is from Jesus. And he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they have they may have life and they may have it to the full. In other words, Jesus says, he's after you. Like there is a person, there's a, there's a spiritual enemy who's after my kids. And that's why I came. I came to give you life and life abundant. So live in my rules, live in my blessing, watch and pray so that you can take your stand against the enemy. First Peter 5, 8 and 9. This is Peter talking to the church and he says, be alert and of sober mind or sound mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. In other words, we resist the devil by standing firm in the faith. So that doesn't mean we look at the devil and we start having conversations with him and trying to, to tell him where to go. It means we resist him by standing firm in the faith. I fix my eyes on Jesus. I remember his promises. I remember his strength. I remember his word. I remember that he says he has conquered the enemy, and I begin to pray those things. And then all of a sudden, the devil disappears because God is mightier and where God is the enemy cannot exist at the same time he says I cast you out you must leave my presence James says to the church submit yourselves then to God resist the devil and he will flee from you it means he'll run away from you the devil will run away from you if you submit yourselves to God and resist him and then Ephesians again it's Paul talking to the church and he says finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So there are schemes every single day coming after us, and it's in watching and praying that we begin to overcome those things. So we are ready. There's two reasons why. One of them is we are ready and watching and praying because the devil is playing games for our life, and we're going to choose to play by God's rules, not the devil's rules. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I want to play by God's rules. He wins every single time, and he has come to give me life and life abundant. And so if there's a way I can win in my everyday life and be victorious over my thoughts, over my habits, over my patterns, over the way I talk to my spouse, over the way I talk to my kids, over the way I interact with my, my coworkers, over the way I interact in my, in my regular life, like when I get angry and when I get frustrated, if I can honor God, in those choices and I can resist the devil, you bet I want that. I want that because that's life and life abundant. Number two is you are not as invincible as you think. <laughs> None of us, we are just not as invincible as we think. So this, this one is for those of us who say, ah, I don't really need to do all that. You know, like, that's ah, no big deal. I'm not worried about it. Like, I, I, I get it. I see you. I know what you're talking about. It's making sense. But you all, can worry about that, and you can do that, and you can make some changes, and, and you can do those things, but I, I got this. I, I got this. I can do it. There's a very sobering warning in Scripture. Again, it's Paul talking to the church in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So if you think you are standing, that's pride. That's pride. Okay, now I just want to back this up with a story. The, the New Testament religious people leaned on the strength of their ancestors. You can go read about it in the Gospels. Jesus is, <laughs> Jesus is talking to a crowd of people, and there's the religious people, and they're going, well, Abraham's, you know, this is why they said they never went into slavery. And I'm like, Have, do you know your history? Like, you were all slaves for 400 years in Egypt. You were in slavery. Uh, but they, like, their generation, we were never in slavery. So he says, we were never in slavery, slavery. Abraham is our ancestor, all these people, and Jesus blows them up. I love it. He blows them up so hard. In essence, he says, excuse me, people, Moses chose me. He says, Abraham chose me. Jacob chose me. Those ancestors that you're relying on, they chose me. In other words, they reoriented their whole entire lives around me. He says, they gave up their dreams on account of me. They left everything they knew. They left their homeland. They left their people. They left their customs. They left their culture on account of me. And he says to them, in essence, you have not done that. You have not chosen me. And so they, the, the kind of takeaway is this, yesterday's victory doesn't guarantee me the trophy for tomorrow's battle. 
Yesterday's victory doesn't guarantee me the trophy for tomorrow's battle. And so the Israelites, they, they, you know, they had a trophy. They, had, they were victorious. They had, they had ancestors and a history that they could count on. But their generation had to choose. Each person in that generation had to choose for themselves whether or not Jesus was their Lord and Savior or God was their God and they were going to follow his commands. And so Jesus says, you have to, don't. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Don't let pride of the past get in the way of what you need for today and what you need for tomorrow. So in the same, same way that we stayed ready. So if you have victories, if you can look over your, your life in the past and you've got victories, you've got some wins under your belt. In the same way I stayed ready and I stayed watchful and I stayed prayerful yesterday and I saw victory, I'm going to do that again today. I'm going to make the choice to do that again today. Today is a new day. I'm going to celebrate the win from yesterday, and I'm going to celebrate the win from today because I've got them, but I'm not going to coast into tomorrow. I'm not going to ride yesterday's victory into tomorrow's battle. So we are ready, and we are watching, and we are praying because the devil is playing games for our lives, and we're not going to play by his rules. And so there, there, there's a really simple takeaway just right here, and that's prayer and fasting. We're in the middle of the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we have two opportunities every Every week for you to get in a corporate group of people and pray together. That's Thursday nights and Saturday mornings. So Thursday nights at 5:30, we had 24 people come out this last Thursday. It was incredible. Just getting together, being encouraged by the Word of God. There's a devotional to set us up, get us fired up to pray, and then we we pray. We contend for the things. We learn how to pray together, and at the end we come together and pray corporately. So it's not an. Don't think that you're coming into a quiet room for an hour and gonna fall asleep. That's not what this is. It's a place where you get to learn how to pray. You get to learn how to fight. You get to learn how to fill yourself with the word of God. And you walk away. Well, you came in heavy. You came in burdened. There were things you wanted God to do. There are things you're contending for. And you leave encouraged because you have met with God. He has taught you how to ask for things and you walk away in victory. And so take us up on those. Those are on the website. You can find information. But Thursday night and Saturday morning, 5.30 and 9 a.m., get here and pray. We're watchful and prayerful. We're watchful. Those are decisions we make. That's a choice I make to be watchful and to be prayerful. So now I want to just give you three keys to fighting temptation really quick. Three keys to fighting temptation. You can repeat these after me. Number one, say, move the line. line. Number two, magnify the cost. cost. And number three, plan your escape. Okay, move the line. So now this is tape. Everybody see the my bright blue roll tape? Okay, so the tape, we're going to put this down on the ground. And on one side, it's going to be God's will. And what do you think is going to be on the other side? Not God's will. (laughs) Whatever the heck it is that I want. Okay, so what we're going to say is uh, move the line. So if the line is God's will, then what happens is we want to know how close can I get to the line there. How close can I get to the line without sinning? That's our question, right? Most of the time, if there's a boundary line, like the fence at your neighbor, like the fence between you and your neighbor, like how close can I get? Like how much of this property is mine? And when, it, when have I crossed the line into your property? Okay. I don't know that any of you are trying to encroach in your neighbor's property. Some of you are, cause it looks greener over there. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you do that? Uh, anyway, so what we're talking about, move the line. So tempt, temptation works. Like let's just throw some easy ones out there. Like uh, if you're a new Christian and you're dating, like, what are the rules for Christian dating? What does that look like? Um, and how do I do it? So, I, so really, it's, you know, like, can we, like, can we hold hands? Can we, can we, like, rub? Like, what, what, like, what can we do? So you want to, like, you're finding out, you know, like, you, you all know. If you are in the dating scene or you are in the dating scene, this is no joke. You want to know the answer, okay? You want to find out how close can I get to the line without going over? Because you don't really want to go over, but like you want every square inch of yours that you can get on this side, okay? Maybe it's, and so this is, it's kind of funny, but in, in like sinful things, we want to know how close we can get to the line. But in things that matter between life and death, there's no way you're going to be anywhere near this stinking line. No way. Like, okay, in your, my worst fear is that I run out of gas, while driving a car. I do not want to be that. I used to be blonde. Now it's kind of brown. I don't want to be that dumb blonde on the side of the road who ran out of gas. Like, I don't want it to happen to me. But some of you have ran out of gas, and it's not that big of a deal. You're like, oh, no big deal. Like, you know, you just call. It's a big deal. You got to walk. You got to put gas in the car, whatever. So you might tempt faith with, with, tempt fate with a car, but think about an airplane. 
Like there is no way in, I almost said that word, that you are going to like, if you're a pilot, there's no way you're going to figure out like, what's the least amount of fuel I can put in this thing and still get to where I need to go. I mean, you want it over full, like how full, like I want to like half a tank of, of fuel left before we land this plane. Like we wouldn't ever, ever, ever tempt it with death, but we do it with sin all the time. How close can I get without going over? And I want to just say this. Temptation isn't always pull the sheets, big stuff. Temptation can be not, it can be, it can be the temptation not to be faithful to your word or your promise to your kids or to your boss. Like you made a promise or you said something. Temptation can be to like renege on that promise. Like, well, something came up, so I I just can't keep it. Or something came up, so it doesn't, like those are, those are small temptations. It can be the temptation to fudge a little here or to fudge a little there. It can be the temptation just to tell part of the truth or a little bit of the truth, maybe not reveal the whole thing. It can be the temptation to stay up late and then hit the snooze button tomorrow instead of getting up just to spend a few minutes with Jesus before you face the world. Those are all little temptations. Temptation isn't always the big stuff. And so what we're going to do when we move the line, that means I'm going to put distance between me and temptation. I'm going to put in the same way that you're not only going to put half a tank of fuel in your airplane and hope you make it, you're going to move the line. So here's some real tangible things. Let's say you're an overspender on online shopping. Like you get sad or you just get in a mood and you're like, I'm making it rain and you don't have the money. And so you just fill your basket and you check out. Give your, give your password to a friend. And say, don't give me that password unless you know I've got the money to make the purchase. Like, that seems extreme, but move the line. If you can't trust yourself on some days, then move the line. Give, get some accountability in there. Social media. Let's say you're spending four and a half hours a day on social media, and you're going, I don't want that anymore. You know, you can put those timers. Timers are dumb. Ah, because it, they, it goes off, and you just ignore it, or you reset it. But even if it's dumb and you're going to ignore it and you're going to reset it, you at least have to come face to face with the fact that you're doing it, you know? So move the timer, move the line, set the timer for a shorter period of time and interact with your lying to yourself. You know what I mean? Like do it and it'll probably motivate you a little bit more to change. Maybe you're lonely sometimes. And so you go to the bar just to be out of the house. You don't want to get drunk. You don't want to meet a guy at a bar, but that's where you go because you're lonely. Move the line. Move the line. You don't have to stay home, but maybe you should go to a restaurant without a bar. So come up with a list of restaurants that don't have bars. So that that's not where you're going to, you're going to be in a crowd of people. Maybe you can meet people, but you're not going to have that temptation. Or maybe you get lonely. And so you go online, get out of the house and go to a life group, find what life group is happening, move the line, whatever it needs to be. And you might be thinking, that all sounds a little bit extreme. Like I, I get it. I hear you. I know what you're saying. I'm considering places in my life where you know, I know I wrestle with some things, but now that you've mentioned it, I can just get better at it. You know, now that you've mentioned it, I can just be better. Like that's, that's what we do. Listen to this. Psalm 16, six, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. This is it. Moving the line leaves me in a place of delight, not a place of regret. Moving the line leaves me in a place of delight, not a place of regret. It's worth it to move the line. Number two, magnify the cost. Everybody say magnify the cost. Because anytime we're tempted to give in to temptation, there is a risk. And so the big question you can choose to ask yourself is this. What if the worst case scenario comes true? What if? that worst case scenario comes to you. Now there's the big ones like, you know, you're having sex outside of marriage and someone gets pregnant, okay? And now you lose your loved one's trust. Maybe you lose your reputation. You've got to navigate a whole world of, of loss and hurt when that, stuff kind of, when that kind of stuff happens. Maybe you keep going to the bars and so you find yourself not intentionally an alcoholic, but some, for some reason, like you just drink a little bit more than you want to. And if you play that tape out, maybe you're going to lose your job. Maybe it's going to cost you your marriage. Maybe it's going to compromise the relationship magnify the cost whatever the temptation is make it bigger because it will get bigger (laughs) and then you have to figure out what's the fallout what are the consequences for that and then there's the little things James 4 17 says this if anyone knows the good they ought to do and they don't do it it is a sin for them and I bring that up because it's those little losses with temptation that feel so bad It's not always the big ones. It's the little ones. And here's why. Because there's good for us to do, and it's in the little things. 
There's good for us to do, and it's in the little things. So when we lose at the little things, we give in to regret and failure, and we let those mind games of the enemy begin to take, you're such a loser. You're never going to do it. You can't get it right. You're terrible at following Jesus. You're not a good Christian. And so because you're not a good Christian, you're not qualified to do this. You're not qualified to do that. You can't pray. Like those little losses affect our relationship with Jesus, and we give in to those dumb mind games of the enemy. And we can outwit him, and it's in the little things. So magnify the cost. Numbers 33, 23 says this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. <laughs> so in those little things, nobody's going to know, nobody's going to see it. But if you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, for you it is a sin. And your sin will find you out. And when your sin finds you out, the enemy is there and he's berating you with all the lies. And Jesus is saying, I've already paid the price. I stand in between heaven and earth and I'm bridging the gap and I'm just asking you to come to me. I'm asking you to come to me. I'm asking you to stand and watch. I'm asking you to watch and pray because I have more for you than that. I have more for you than those tricks and those lies and those deceptions that keep you bound and insecure. Okay? Blah! So, Magnifying the cost keeps me from having to hide. Amen. Magnifying the cost keeps me from, if I blow it up in the first place, I'll never go there. <laughs> Magnifying the cost keeps me from having to hide. And then number three, plan your escape. The best example in all of scripture of someone doing this is in the Old Testament with a guy named Joseph. Now, if you don't know who Joseph is, you need to know that Elliot is a lot like Joseph. Okay? <laughs> Let me describe Joseph to you from the word of God. Genesis 39, verse 6, it says, Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So Joseph is a well-built and handsome man. And it says, verse 7, After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. So Potiphar was Joseph's boss. And Potiphar had a wife. And the wife began to notice Joseph, this well-built, handsome man. And she says, in her mind, hey, you're actually not in her mind. She says it out loud. <laughs> she says, you're very handsome and you're well, you're well built. And she says, come to bed with me. <laughs> now imagine, I just imagine how easy it would have been for Joseph to give in. Because think about it. If you know Joseph's story, he's like, well, this isn't my homeland. My brothers don't even know where I am. You know, his whole family thinks he's dead. He doesn't exist anymore in their eyes. We're all alone. Uh, nobody's going to find out. And I mean, this good looking cougar is flirting me down, you know, like I, I didn't initiate it. She did. So if she did, like, it's all good, right? She made the first move. Okay. So there's that super easy. Or there's this, he could have given in to the temptation because he wasn't happy with God. Because if you know Joseph's story, he wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers beat him up and put him in a pit. He wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers sold him into slavery. And so in Joseph's mind, he could have justified it and said, since God didn't do what I wanted him to do, I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. And so often, maybe we wouldn't recognize it at first, but we use our disappointments with God to justify our disobedience towards him. And so I would say to us, don't use your disappointments to justify your disobedience. Don't use your disappointments to justify, work out your disappointments. <laughs> Talk to the Lord about them. But you can read this story. Joseph rejected the cougar's advances. We're talking about how to plan your escape. But he, she didn't give up. Like this, she was like, <laughs> she's in heat. That's a cat. <laughs> we have a cat in our backyard. She's a lady cat. And she just like, shut up. Like she won't stop. Okay. The cougar wouldn't give up, wouldn't stop. Okay. She wasn't taking over an answer. So in Genesis 39, verse 12, you can pick up the story. They, they find themselves in the house alone. And so she caught him by his cloak and she was pulling him and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Joseph was like, I'm, I, I, I'm out of here. I said, no, I'm not doing it. Okay. In Joseph's defense, his life had been bad enough on no account of his own, and he wasn't about to make it worse on purpose, okay? But if you read Joseph's story, he ran out of the house, and he still got thrown in prison. He still, he got blamed for something he didn't do. He left his coat, and then he said, a good name is better than a good coat. 
And his name, eventually, you know, it came back to him and there was blessing and there was provision, but he had to run away from temptation for a long time. And he had to deal with consequences that had nothing to do with his actions. His actions were good and righteous. And he still had to, he had to suffer some consequences just based on the world. But in the end, with faithfulness and in, you know, staying away from temptation, there was blessing, but it took years. And so I would say to us, like some things are not instant gratification, holding the line, moving the line, magnifying the cost and planning our escape. There's victory on the other side, but we've got to trust Jesus in that process. Okay, so the good news is that when you're tempted, scripture says he's always going to give you an escape every single time. There's no temptation that the devil is going to bring to us, which God hasn't already made a way, made a plan of escape for us. There's no lust. There's no financial temptation. There's no breach of integrity. There's no relational loss in which God hasn't already said there is a door and there is another way. For some of us, you just got to run out. For some of us, the Lord is saying, run out of the situation that you're in. You need to completely abandon it and choose me. Run out of that place and let it go. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to restore everything that you need, but you've got to get yourself out of that place of temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I want to focus on that word endure it because it's not like it's never temptations are never going to come to us. There's an enduring, there's a standing strong, there's a being courageous, there's counting like we've got to, I'm not, when I say interact with temptation, I don't mean entertain it. I mean, we've got to see it and we've got to choose to move away from it. And the Lord says there is a way that you can endure it. You can overcome it. Joseph had to endure a lot of things. So I want to say just another thing. Planning my escape helps me see God's way out. Planning my escape helps me see God's way out, which means I'm not subject to whatever temptation brings my way. There is a way out, and God is going to help me to see it. And the cost may be high, but I'm willing to pay it because I want his freedom. I want his redemption. I want his power. I want his strength. I want his might. I want everything that he purchased for me alive in my life. So following Jesus isn't one big choice. It's those countless daily choices and the difference between life and death are in the everyday choices that you and I make. So giving our life to Jesus, we don't get to put on that invincibility cloak. But what it does do is it opens the door for his spirit to lead us down paths of righteousness where we get to make better choices and we choose better things. I want to just tie this together. It's um, almost impossible to make better choices when we're trying to do it on our own, which means we need accountability. We need relationships. We need people who know our story, people who love us, who, who care about us, who can see when something is wrong and help us go in another direction. They can see when we're beating ourselves up over something done and give us freedom and remind us of the words that God has spoken to us, who can pray for us and, and help to set us free from those things. And life groups are coming up. So if prayer and fasting was the first one, this one's life groups. On February 4th, we're going to launch all of our life groups, but it's not too late for you to start a group. And you know what? It's so easy. The first eight weeks of our groups are going to be this book. It's called Seeds. The whole church, we're going to go through this whole thing together. Can I tell you how easy it is? You're saying, oh, I've never led a group. I can't do it. Oh, yes, you can. (laughs) Oh, yes, you can. Week one, this is what you do. This is what you say. This is how you pray. Like, it's all here. It's all here. And we, we have this for every single week. So it's not a difficult thing to do. And what it does is, I know there's people in the room who you guys are newish to Lifeline Church, but you've got friends, you've got neighbors, you've got a community of people who are dancing on the fence of belonging to a church, they're dancing on the fence of salvation. You know what you do is you you decide that you're gonna lead a group and that's your target audience. Hey, come over for dinner every Wednesday night. I'd love to just, we're gonna do this book together. And so as, as 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 a family unit, as a friend unit, as a neighborhood, we're gonna do this together and you're gonna see salvation. You're gonna see breakthrough in the lives of the people you love the most because it doesn't necessarily have to be Lifeline Church. You've got people, you have people and you have space. And so you're gonna invite them in and you're gonna bring them in. And uh, it's 
today, today. Life group training is happening today. So it's about an hour, maybe an hour and a half of time. It's going to happen at 1230. So come back after second service, 1230. The classrooms are remaining open. We have lunch. We're going to walk you through what it means to lead a life group, how simple it is. We're going to resource you. We're going to equip you. We're going to give you this so you can take it home and read it over so you can be prepared. Um, and then uh, we're going to answer any questions that you have. So if you're thinking about it, if your heart's been tagged, you're like, yeah, that's me. I know it. Then please show up, come through the training. We'd love to resource you because there are people God wants to reach uh, th through you and, and through your life. So what I want to do right now is just invite us to pray. So if you would close your eyes, bow your heads. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, and we just, I've, I begin to invite your spirit and your presence to rest upon us. Lord, I thank you for your word that you minister to your people. Lord, I thank you that none of us is here by accident, but you have been and you do have a word that you, you wish to minister to us. You desire to meet with us every single day. You desire to deposit good things in our life. You desire to give us life and life abundant. You desire to restore broken places, to heal damaged relationships, to give us hope instead of despair, to give us joy instead of sadness, to walk us through the difficult things of life. That's who you are. And so, Father, I thank you that you are meeting people's needs. You are drawing people into your presence. You are inching people one step closer to your goodness and to your abundance. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to lead us through something. What I want you to do is just be incredibly honest about the places that you're vulnerable. Be incredibly honest about asking yourself and seeing, asking the Lord, where does the spiritual enemy attack me? Is it in your pride? Well, what about me? Is it in justifying sin because you're mad at God? Well, if God hadn't done that, then I wouldn't be doing this. Do you find yourself comparing or compromising yourself financially because you, you put your security there? Do you maybe tell lies sometimes to make yourself feel better or look better? Do you gossip behind other people? Are there temptations to do those things? Are you carrying any unforgiveness in your heart that's causing you to, to react negatively towards people? Do you find yourself giving into lustful temptations again and again and again, looking at things or even acting in a way that you know is dishonoring to God? Do you find yourself taking God for granted? You, you know he's there, but you're not interacting and watching and praying and, and allowing him into those places in your life where you need victory, where you need wisdom. Maybe you've been following Jesus, but you feel like you just woke up one day and you're lukewarm. Where you used to be passionate about the things of God, you used to be asking questions, you used to be leaning in and seeking, but now you just kind of exist. I just want to give you an opportunity to give those things to Jesus, and I'll just kind of lead you through that. But Father, we hand over those places in our life. Lord, we recognize that, that the life we have, if we've given our life to you, was purchased with your blood. And it was purchased with your blood for a purpose because there's power that you want to give to us. There is fulfillment. There is hope. There is peace. You, you want all of you alive inside of all of us. And so, Jesus, we offer those places to you, and we ask you, Father, to fill them instead with things that are from you. Lord, we exchange, we, we give you the, the sin and the yuck that we're carrying, Father, and we ask instead and we receive instead the good things and the wisdom and the guidance that you wish to give to us. And just with every head bowed and eye closed still, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're in the room and you would say that you've never given your life to Jesus, you've heard about him, but you haven't made him Lord and Savior of your life. And so while he's bridging the gap between heaven and earth and saying, I've got everything for you, you haven't come into that relationship and you want to do that today. You want his abundance. You want his blessing. You want his favor. You want everything he has for you. Then I'm talking to you. And then I'm also talking to those who feel like you woke up and you're just lukewarm. You used to have that relationship with Jesus. But if you're honest, you would say, like, I just, I say that I know the Lord, but I haven't interacted in, with him in a long time. And you're saying, I want to interact with him. I want to know him. I want, I want him alive in my life. Uh, then both groups, I just love you to lift your hand in the air because I, I want to pray with you. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see your hand. God is so good. He's on the move. Awesome. Church, can we just pray this prayer together? Father God. I thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I repent of my sin. And I thank you for your forgiveness. I receive that. 
I believe you're running after me with open arms. And you love me. Help me to believe that. Help me to walk in that. Thank you for your spirit who you gave to be with me every day. Let me hear your spirit. Let me respond to your spirit. Would you, would you lead me every day to make choices that honor you and to do the things that are right and good? In Jesus' name, amen.